One of the most polemic issues in the West world, when we think about a Muslim woman, is related to clothing and specifically to hijab. What do you think about this cloth? Do you think it is a cultural thing or do you feel forced to wear it because of religious rules? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. and. Uh, um, so hijab is very complicated issue. It uh, it is not only a cloth. It uh, uh, it comes with many uh, layered discourses and um, lot of religious, patriarchal, and the other uh, uh, sort of uh, power relation uh, and power structure come with hijab. So as a person who practiced hijab, who used to practice hijab um, um, because I was a believer for two years of my life so and uh, it was a part of my rebellion to my uh, family to have not only the scarf but also the, uh, the long hijab called chador. So uh, I experienced that it's not only a cloth. Uh, so it's not simple as uh, it uh, looks like. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, in the West, I, um, I see the discussion is about uh, having or not having a choice. I don't, I, I, I don't uh, disagree with that uh, discourse because um, women have to have the right to, to choose uh, if they want to have a job or not but but all, but but also i need i need i think that we need to look at the issue of hijab from another perspective which is the perspective of right uh, for example uh, when you and it happens in western countries every day when you uh, put uh, a five years, six years, seven years old girl um, under the hijab when you uh, oblige her to have that scarf uh, and I mean by the family in the western countries it happens and the western society tolerates it to me it's a violation of her right mm -hmm. because uh, she's not, she hasn't reached to the age of uh, majority to have a choice uh, to choose or to either to choose or not choose uh, not to choose a hijab so uh, I'm so, sometimes it's very surprising to me and it's uh, very concerning to me when uh, for example in the western countries we um, we are uh, we, we say um, the marriage under the age of majority is not a genuine marriage because uh, a girl or a boy, a, a, a child under the age of majority cannot give a genuine consent. So and my question is, if, the, if a marriage is not a genuine marriage, is a forced marriage under the age of majority, why nobody's talking about forced hijab under the age of majority? So I think uh, because the Western society and the, uh, the activists in the Western countries uh, are afraid of uh, being cri criticized or being blamed as or labeled as Islamophobe. But as someone who is coming from an Islamic country, who, ha who used to have the hijab, I'm insisting to uh, look at the hijab from another perspective, from the perspective of right, and we have to ask ourselves every time that we see a woman under hijab that uh, regardless of the, the choice, if any rights has been violated for these women. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask that because I think most of the time there, uh, um, a rights violation is involved when you see a woman under a hijab. Um, it would not be like very obvious even for that woman but as I said when you put a girl under hijab from the age of five what other choice she would have when she reaches uh, when she reaches to the age of 18 or 19 
We heard about some new very conservative laws related to marriage and reproductive rights. Can you explain that? Is it true that women can lose their job if they don't have at least one child? Um, well, in fact, uh, there are two bills uh, at the moment are being discussed in Iranian parliaments about uh, sexual and reproductive rights and health. Uh, the aim of those uh, bills uh, uh, is uh, uh, restricting uh, women's rights and women's control over their bodies and their sexualities. So um, uh, these laws consider women and the, the main role of women according to those laws uh, uh, is being a wife and a mother. So these laws uh, aim to restrict women's right to work and right to education uh, and push them back into their homes in order to make baby as much as possible. Uh, yes, that, that, that is true and uh, these new law, uh, laws are, uh, will be passed if there is not enough international pressure on Iranian government to withdraw those laws. Mm. You are a lawyer, so we guess you have studied at university. Have women currently the same rights as men in education? Um, when I started studying law, there was uh, a restriction for uh, women in higher education. Uh, for example, in uh, the field of law, uh, only 25 of the students could be women and 75 of the students had to be men. Uh, after a lot of struggle and uh, protest, they changed those laws and they uh, um, uh, um, released that ban. So women and men uh, could go to the university as uh, equal. So and it uh, turned out uh, uh, in the situation that women occupied uh, more than 60% of the university seats. And then again, after uh, uh, since two, three years ago, uh, they started new policies to uh, decrease the number of women in the universities, uh, women who access to, the, to higher education uh, by uh, um, um, putting a negative gender quota on some uh, fields, again, such as laws, law, engineering, and medicine. Stoning is still alive in Iran. It is a normal way of punishment. Does it affect the same way men and women? Um, unfortunately, stoning as a punishment for adultery is still uh, in Iran's penal code, despite the all efforts that had been made to um, change that law. Um, according to the uh, to the Iranian penal code. Uh, a married woman or a married man, if he, if she or he has an external marital relationship, he would be punished by uh, stoning. Uh, uh, okay. Can I? Yeah. Can, can you? Ask? Yeah. Start again. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Okay. So stoning. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, despite uh, uh, all objections and efforts to. Uh, change uh, the law, stoning as the punishment of adultery is still in uh, Iranian penal code. So according to those uh, laws, if a married woman or a married man has an uh, uh, extramarital relationship, uh, she or he would be sentenced to death by stoning. Um, so it uh, has nothing to do with gender, but it relates to the marital status. But as a matter of fact, women are more being sentenced to death by stoning than men because of the fact that women are uh, more deprived from having uh, um, appropriate legal counsel, uh, counseling or access to the lawyers. Most of women who have been sentenced to death by stoning are illiterate and do, 
sometimes they do not know uh, the, uh, um, uh, the language of the course which is very um, uh, complicated and uh, there are many Arabic words in the language and language that the judges adopted and there are many elements that uh, uh, as reasons that women uh, would end up more than men but uh, with uh, the pun with the stony but in terms of the implementation uh, answering to this question is not uh, easy because there has been always a strong governmental censorship about the stoning cases so they uh, don't uh, uh, announce or declare the uh, stoning that are being implemented so sometimes they um, announce them as just executions without being a, uh, 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 without specifying that what, which kind of execution uh, they were implemented. But uh, until 2011, I think Amnesty International uh, ha, uh, has identified has uh, confirmed more than 70 cases of stoning being implemented after uh, Iran's 1979 revolution. So the, these, this is not the number of all stoning that has been implemented, but it's the number of the stonings that Amnesty can confirm. How do you ended up being a women's rights activist? Um, it's a long story and uh, it's very difficult to um, briefly narrate it, but and it's also a process, so it's not like a key or a like key that you turn on and you become an activist. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a long process that you uh, uh, you have gone through. But for me, there was a turning point, and that turning point was uh, because I studied law. I knew everything about the discriminatory laws, and also I had been deprived from some uh, privilege and some rights uh, because of being a girl or being a woman. But, and I uh, read all of the feminist books that, which were available in Iranian book market, uh, like the books of Simone de Beauvoir and the other uh, famous feminists. But all of them didn't make me a feminist. Uh, the turning point was when I, uh, when my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. So and I had to uh, go back to the work after when she was uh, three months old. And uh, so I became a mother and it was the first time that I felt uh, that because of being a mother, I and also at the same time I want to be as active as I was in my job and I had a very heavy responsibility at that time I had uh, I, I was working in a newspaper uh, so my life uh, became so difficult but it was like nobody uh, realized it Everyone was blaming and criticizing me because of like a very bad mother who uh, put her baby at home, her um, tiny three months old baby at home and she, uh, she, uh, they, they treated me like I was very selfish and so it was the, the first time that I felt it's not just, it's not, it doesn't seem right and so I have to do something because I, perhaps I cannot change the society um, to look at me in a different way and to understand my situation and to be more sympathetic to that situation but I have to do something for my daughter. I cannot uh, uh, allow uh, uh, this, this situation be uh, my daughter will experience the same situation when she uh, uh, will be a mother. And that was the turning point and I just decided uh, to focus uh, on women's rights and so I started writing, uh, uh, I started a column in that newspaper about women's rights and that was uh, actually the first uh, thing that I did uh, uh, in the long process of 
becoming a feminist. Can you tell us about the social movement in Iran? What, uh, what do you mean about social movement? Um, about social movement in families, mm -hmm. um, the difference between social movement in Iran and about in, in the in the rest of the of the world. Um. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have uh, a diverse feminist movement, and I believe it's the same uh, as the other feminist mm -hmm. movement uh, everywhere else. So there are many um, uh, groups and uh, with different backgrounds and with different approaches to the same issues. And sometimes uh, we uh, get together and uh, we collaborate with each other uh, for a short period of time, but we cannot tolerate each other for a long time. So the coalitions are uh, fragile uh, most of the time, but we are trying to uh, to uh, work with each other time to time. Okay. Do you feel it was worth it to fight for human rights? Um, if I uh, if I thought uh, otherwise, I would have not been here. <laughs> so I think that I'm, as a human rights defender, I, I think there is no way but to be optimistic and uh, constantly thinking that okay, I, uh, I uh, can uh, do something and my action uh, will make a difference. Do you feel close to Western families? Do you share its main claims? Um, the, the answer is yes or no. Yes and no. Because uh, we share a lot of uh, common values and ideals and aims. So all of us, uh, the main concern of all of us is patriarchy. But when it comes to the um, the examples of patriarchy or the kind of patriarchal system and the power structure that we have to struggle with, uh, there are uh, many differences. Uh, and also, uh, for example, women in the West uh, uh, are not usually uh, victims of uh, Islamic extremism. Mm -hmm. Uh, why we, uh, we in the Muslim countries are the first and the most uh, uh, victims of uh, the extremism. So these kind of discussions that are happening now in the West about the extremism, Islamic is extremist groups, uh, were just um, starting in the society like Iran 35 years ago. But at that time nobody looked into the issue. Nobody realized that it's becoming an issue. Uh, and nobody in the, in at least Western feminists, uh, didn't feel that they would relate to the issue and their future uh, would be related to that issue. So uh, the issues are different. The issues that we are dealing with are different, but I think the core uh, mm, concept of patriarchy and patriarchal system is the same and so the, the core aim and idea uh, are the same. Now you are living in London. Did you get used to the Western way of life? Um, so it's another state <laughs> <laughs> because um, I, I rarely find something very unusual uh, to my uh, lifestyle in Western lifestyle. So as, uh, as someone who grew up in a, um, a not religious family um, and also uh, with um, ra raising up with some many, many of uh, like liberal values, let's say, not Western values. So, as I said, I would um, barely and rarely find myself like a stranger in, some, in a place like London. 
And as a matter of fact, sometimes I find London uh, a more religious city than Tehran. <laughs> you would, it, it would be like, um, um, I, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, if, you, if, if you walk, if I walk uh, to uh, Oxford Street in uh, London Central, so I would see more women with burger. The number of uh, women with, with burger that I would see in Oxford this week would be much more than the whole number of women that I saw with burger in my country, Iran. So that's why I think the, uh, the way that the Western, uh, the, in the Western countries look into the societies like Iran or the, women, or the women who come from those societies is full of stereotypes because uh, you think that okay, the Western lifestyle is something very, very different from the lifestyle that someone like she uh, used to have. But as a matter of fact, there is not much except for foods which are different i don't think that and music i don't think that there is uh very much differences all right well that's all thank you very much Shadi. we hope you can come back to your country very soon in a new iran where women are free and have the same rights as men thank you thank you and best wishes for you as well <laughs>